Good afternoon. I uh, am really excited to introduce Alan today. I've known Alan for a long time, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. He is a very accomplished person, as you will soon hear. But m one of my favorite stories of accomplishment for him that I've never forgotten was, um, if you remember, he has a connection to Harvard, which I'll explain in a minute. But Alan, apparently, when he was taking a final exam years ago, sat in the class and the professor very clearly said, you have one hour to take the exam. When the exam is over, I'll instruct you to put your pencils down. If you continue to write, you'll fail the test. Ready, begin. So for one hour, all the students wrote, filled out their book, wrote their essay. Professor announced one minute remaining. Gave everybody a warning. One minute later, okay, time's up. Put your pencils down. Everyone gathered up their papers, went up, put them in a nice pile in front of the professor. There's Alan sitting at his desk, just writing away, totally oblivious to the fact that the time is up. He gets done about three or four minutes later. Class is empty. Professor's just standing up there like this, just letting him go. And Alan gets his stuff, and he puts his pencil down. He's got a smile on his face, kind of proud of his work. Puts his papers together, walks up, and hands them to the professor. And the professor says, Sir, you failed the exam. I clearly told you when the hour's up, you cannot keep writing, and you kept writing. And Alan looked at him and said, do you have any idea who I am? And the professor said, I have no clue who you are. And Alan sticks the piece of paper up, shoves it in the middle, puts it down, and goes, good, and walked away. <laughs> True story, yep, true story. Well, Alan Proctor is the founder and principal of Proctor's Linking M Mission to Money and president and CEO of the Center for Social Enterprise Development. He has nearly 30 years of experience evaluating the financial health of organizations, developing effective strategic plans, and enhancing organizational effectiveness. He is an author, columnist, blogger, speaker, advisor, and social enterprise advocate. Alan's list of accomplishments is way too big for me to possibly read for myself, so as not to be accused of having too long of an introduction, I've asked for some help. Teddy? He holds an AB from Harvard College and a PhD in economics from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. After college, he was a division chief Bank and Monetary Analysis, Regional Economics for Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Then, he was the Deputy Director of New York City Office of Management and Budget. Concurrently, he was an adjunct professor at Columbia University's uh, Graduate School of Then, Executive Director for the New York State Financial Control Board for New York City. He was also a founding member of National Advisory Council on State and Local Budgeting in Chicago. He then went to Harvard University as a, as a lecturer at the Kennedy School. While there, he was appointed Vice President for Finance and Chief Financial Officer. That makes most people's career, but Allen then came to Columbus as the Executive Director of the Ohio Police and Fire Pension Fund. While in Columbus, he serves on the Treasurer's Advisory Board of Worthington School District and is an independent director and chair of Audit Committee for Kahiki Foods. Allen is a board member of Columbus Association <coughs> of Performing Arts, CAPA, CATCO, and the Ohio Tech Angels Fund. And if that isn't enough, he has also spoken at TEDx and published a few books. And best of all, Alan is a member of Columbus Rotary. Help me welcome Alan Proctor as our speaker today. Well, I hope that put you to sleep. Sure did to me. I'm very happy to be here today um, to really tell you about uh, one of the new uh, developments in the last uh, five or ten years that I think is uh, creating a tremendous opportunity for hope and sustainability of our nonprofits. You know, we have to remember why, why do we have nonprofits in the first place? We have nonprofits 
because there are things that the market economy can't do. They can't make money at it. So he created this special class of businesses who, as you know, they can accept contributions, they can get out of paying some taxes, but they're there because our communities have needs that have to be provided. Now, all of you, because of your involvement in our community, know some nonprofit that does something that's helpful to our community. And if you've worked with a nonprofit, you know how valuable their work is. Today I'm going to talk to you about social enterprise, but for you to understand why social enterprise is so important, I need to give you a little bit of background about what's happening in the nonprofit world today. Now some of you won't be able to see this chart back there, but fundamentally this was a survey that's done by the Nonprofit Finance Fund, which is out of New York City, which does I think the best research and thought about nonprofits in the United States. And they surveyed all nonprofits and they said, well, is there an increasing demand for what you do? And in 2013, the vast majority said yes. People are at our doors asking us to do even more. The Nonprofit Finance Fund said, well, how about this year? How about 2014? And once again, over 80%, and this is just the nonprofits in Ohio, said, people are asking us to do more. Well, the natural question that comes from that is, fine, so are you doing it? And this is where we have to face a very sad reality. And any of you who are in a nonprofit face this reality every day. They said, I can't do more. I don't have enough resources. Over half in 2013 said they couldn't deal with the increased demand for what they were doing. And in 2014, the same story occurred again. People are asking us to do more, but we don't have the resources. Well, what's our traditional way, Ben, of dealing with that? We hire a fundraiser. And we have that fundraiser go around and ask people to help support the good work that we do. And this worked for a long, long time. But the world started to change in 2001. Or I should say, our perception became more realistic starting in 2001. Because I'm going to show you a chart in one second that totally changed my attitude about how we need to support our nonprofit community and how they need to be sustainable. This line chart describes charitable contributions as a share of nonprofit revenues. So this tells you how much of the money they have to support their programs is coming from charitable contributions. This chart starts in 1985. I call that a straight line. There has not been a year when charitable contributions amounted to more than 25% of all the revenues that nonprofits have to support what they're doing. And if it couldn't rise above that level in the boom boom late 1980s, it couldn't rise above that level in the late 90s, which we all know in retrospect was pretty sweet. And if it couldn't make any progress between 2003 and 2007, the one window of non-recession we had, it's not going to go above 25% in our lifetime. Well, what's the other 75%? The other 75% is nonprofits doing what you do in your businesses every day. They sell goods or services under contracts, for fees, or for reimbursements. Yes, nonprofits is the wrong word for these organizations. They're businesses. So, what are we going to do if increasing charitable contributions aren't going to help them meet the demands for what's out there? 
Well, the first thing is we have to understand and accept that a nonprofit really is two businesses running at the same time. The first is its mission, why it was created. It was created to do something that we can't do as for-profit businesses because we can't make money. So there must be something they lose money at. But if charitable contributions have never gotten above 25%, what are they going to do? Well, first, we have to recognize that they're businesses. They have to be profitable. And we've, we've got to remove from our mind this notion that a nonprofit is supposed to lose money. If you always lose money, the same thing will happen to a nonprofit as happens to any other business. You go bankrupt. We have to be willing to acknowledge and accept that nonprofits have to be profitable. But the reality today is that most government contracts lose money for a nonprofit, and a sad majority of foundation grants also lose money for a nonprofit. So, what makes up the difference? They have to have positive earned revenue activities. And running a line of business that makes money is what social enterprise is. Well, you say, well, uh, how do you do that? I mean, nonprofits, uh, how, how do they think about making money? Well, let's talk about a couple of stories. Andy runs a nonprofit organization that was started to do weatherization in low income communities. Can't make money doing that. It's neighborhoods that have no income. It'd be like doing weatherization in South Columbus. They're not going to be able to pay for it. So his nonprofit started because it had a huge grant from the US Department of Energy. But Andy thought about that and said, you know, if I'm this need for weatherization in our in a, this low income communities is not going to disappear when this grant ends. Are we just going to stop, get a grant, do the work, grant ends? He said, no. My job as a nonprofit is to be a reliable provider of a community need. So he said, if I can do housing inspections in low income communities, I can do housing inspections in upper income communities. If I can do weatherization for people who have no income, I can do weatherization for people who have pretty good incomes. And if I can do it for free for the grant funded programs, I can do it at a price that gives me a profit. And that's exactly what he did. He formed a social enterprise to do exactly what he does in low income communities, but he changed the place, the person, and the price. And think about that in your own business. You could lose money in a profit making business by where you choose to locate, who your customer base is, and what prices you charge. But that may seem a little esoteric, so let's bring it home. Is everyone familiar with the Mount Carmel hospital system? They have the New Albany Surgical Hospital. They have St. Anne's. They have Mount Carmel East on East Broad Street. And they have Mount Carmel West in Franklinton. On the left is the New Albany Surgical Hospital. Its profit margin, when last reported, was 19%. That's a pretty good business by any standard. At St. Anne's, their profit margin is 9%. Now, you'd say, well, geez, why are they a nonprofit? You know, they're making money like anybody. They like, must be a for profit hospital. Well, no. The answer is they have a hospital in Franklinton, and they lose money on that. And what makes them a nonprofit? is that they run the hospital system in Franklinton. What makes them sustainable is they essentially run social enterprises by locating in the wealthier parts of the community. 
And you see all the hospitals in town are doing that. They also do it with their specialties. All the expansion in this town is on neurology, oncology, orthopedics, and cardiology. Very profitable specialties for hospitals. That's how they support their charity care, their pediatrics, and their um, uh, intensive care units. So let's bring it even closer to home and talk about how a nonprofit uses social enterprise to be sustainable. Now, what we have here is a, a chart I use to help describe social enterprises. And on the horizontal dimension, uh, we'll locate lines of business. If something's on the left-hand side, it loses money. And if something's on the right-hand side, it makes money. Nonprofits have a little more difficult challenge because they have to worry about what's really close to their nonprofit mission and what's not so close to their nonprofit mission. Life Care Alliance runs Meals on Wheels. Meals on Wheels is a money losing program. Life Care Alliance believes it if, if it is going to serve the needs of its community, it should never have a waiting list. If anybody comes to their door and says, I need Meals on Wheels, they'll provide it. That's not true about almost any other Meals on Wheels program in the state of Ohio. How are they able to do that? How are they able to deliver on their mission as well or better than any other Meals on Wheels program? Because they have embraced social enterprise. They thought about what do we do? They said, well, we really understand logistics because we know how to get the right meal to the right person at the right time. And we really understand packaging so that hot stays hot and cold stays cold. And we really know how to run a commercial kitchen so we can meet the USDA minimum nutrition standards within our budget. So they said, remember place, person, and price. So they said, if we can do that for people who are homebound who don't have any money to pay for it, we can do it for people who would like the convenience of having a meal delivered to them at home. And they started a higher income meal program for people who can afford to pay. That's a social enterprise. It's run to make a profit and they use those profits specifically so that they can cover the losses on the Meals on Wheels program. But they didn't stop there because they're entrepreneurs, just like we see in the for-profit sector. And they said, if we can deliver to the right place and we can package it, we can do it in a steam table. And you know what? I want my employees to have a full 40-hour week, and when the trucks leave for Meals on Wheels at noon, how can I give these people jobs in the afternoon? So they said, we'll start a corporate catering program. Because it's not so close to their mission and Meals and Wheels, they run it at a very healthy profit margin. And that corporate catering program, once again, its purpose is to earn profits in order to support the Meals on Wheels program. And they didn't stop there because they said, if I can put a steam table on a truck, I can put a steam table in my own location, and there's no place for local businesses, employees, to have lunch. So they opened a cafe. They started three for-profit businesses precisely to supplement that philanthropy and fundraising that isn't growing in the United States. And for that reason, they are able to deliver on their mission better than anyone else. It's legal. It's necessary. You're all familiar with uh, Zumbezi Bay? Zumbezi Bay is organized as a for-profit corporation, the subsidiary of the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium. They pay corporate taxes just like you do in your own businesses. Why did they start a water park? Because they took over the wilds five years ago the largest preserve for endangered species in the Western Hemisphere. 
Just by saying that, you know, Zumbezi Bay, uh, I'm sorry, the wilds, no matter how many zip lines and yurts they're going to build, is never going to break even. So they built a for-profit business. We could give you examples forever, but let me finish with one last example here locally. The AIDS Resource Center of Ohio runs a, research, a clinic where they give people counseling and advice, they provide uh, medical exams, and they write prescriptions uh, for um, any uh, medicines that uh, their visitors need. And for those who have no money, they would be able to dispense uh, the medicines right there. But they noticed that a fair number of the people who came to their resource center were taking the prescriptions and going to CVS and Walgreens. And they said, well, running a resource center will never be able to cover just by fundraising. And they looked a few states over and saw in the state of Wisconsin that a similar organization had started a for-profit pharmacy. So they went through the same steps that you would go through if you were starting a new business. They developed a business plan. They looked at other best practices in other areas. They looked at how the Wisconsin operation was running their pharmacy. They looked at the competition in their area. They did site surveys, just like anyone would do who was looking to start a new business. And they opened up a pharmacy. In its first year, it made almost a million dollars in uh, profits, and it's targeted to make two to three million dollars a year to supplement the philanthropy to support their good work for people with AIDS. Now, we don't want to make the mistake that some people did, and you may have read the cover story in Business First on August 14th, where AIDS Resource Center said, well, some of our donors are saying, well, now that you've got a pharmacy to make money, you don't need contributions anymore. No. Remember, social enterprise is there to supplement philanthropy. The, the pharmacy is never going to be able to meet all the needs of running the resource center at its best. Nonprofits need to do fundraising, but they need to form social enterprises to build earned revenues. This will make the nonprofits more sustainable. Now, what I want to encourage you to think about is how do we create an environment in this community to really support nonprofits to start social enterprises. We have some good examples in this town. I talked about the Columbus Zoo, uh, Goodwill, Goodwill stores net about a million dollars per store per year to support their rehabilitation programs, Life Care Alliance. But you know, the examples I've given are fairly large nonprofits. They're large nonprofits, so they were able to self-finance the startup of a new business. But if we really want to help more nonprofits develop lines of business to help them meet their needs, we need to figure out ways in order for them, for the smaller ones, to be able to investigate a new line of business, test it out, see if it's viable. And if it is commercially viable, help them to finance it so they can actually get it going and be self-sustaining. What we've learned around the country is that in order to have vibrant startup businesses, you need to have five steps. Now, we've learned how to do this in the technology space. We do this all the time. We have Tech Columbus, we have accelerators, we have incubators, even our government, State of Ohio, Third Frontier, provides huge amounts of money. And we have Ohio Tech Angels Fund, which provides angel capital to start that. But what we need in social enterprise is the same thing. We need, what we've learned is in all areas, you need outreach. That is, when someone's coming up with a new idea, they need to know how to link into it. They need to know who else is busy in this area. You need workshops to give people some basic skills, to help teach them. 
Any of you started your own business? Did you know how to do it from square one? You went, you took classes, you went to workshops, you link into SCORE or you'd work with any of the organizations in town that are geared to help build small businesses. Social enterprises need this too. We need what's called, whoops, we, what did I do? I hit the wrong button. You need boot camps. What's a boot camp? A boot camp is an intense 48-hour period of time where you really put your business plan through so that if it doesn't have legs, you just stop wasting your time. And if it does have legs, you know you can take it to the next step. You've heard this, uh, what's popular in the tech space is they talk about hackathons. Um, uh, you'll see a maker's fair at COSI on October 11th. Um, but we need the mentoring and we need practice pitch sessions. And what's happened around the country is they formed organizations that basically help develop that, just like we have Tech Columbus here to help develop the technology companies. But the other thing you need for this to work is you need investment capital. And as I said earlier, um, the ones that have gotten going in this town have been the large organizations who have self-financed their own revenues. For example, uh, Life Care Alliance, to start their first uh, catering program, needed $80,000. Chuck Gehring tells me it took him 18 months to be able to save that amount of money. Now, those of you who have started businesses know $80,000 of capital is not much of an investment. We need to start it faster. Now, there have been social impact funds around the country that have started, but they've started very large. And one of the things that's disappointing to me is those, those investment funds, 70% of all their capital has left the United States and gone to foreign countries. If we really want to support our local nonprofits, develop social enterprises, we need to find ways for capital in central Ohio to go to social enterprises in central Ohio. So what are we doing about that? Well, first, the first thing we've learned is those two things need to be linked. Because if they're not linked, you'll just help non uh, nonprofits develop social enterprises. You'll say, OK, you're all ready to go. Find an investor, and nothing will happen. Or you'll form a social enterprise fund, and they'll say, well, there's not enough deal flow locally, so uh, we'll go invest it in some other state. So those two things need to be linked. What we've done this year, and to let you know about it, so that um, uh, if you're interested, I'll be glad to tell you more about it, is uh, we formed an organization, the Center for Social Enterprise Development, here in Central Ohio. And our goal is to support uh, the nonprofits in Central Ohio to develop ideas to form revenue-earning enterprises, to give them the support they need to uh, see if it's ready for prime time. What we're also doing is we're forming an investment fund we call Cinco Fund, Community Investment Network of Central Ohio, which will be modeled exactly after Ohio Tech Angels Fund to be able to provide startup capital to these new uh, organizations. If you want any information about that, uh, our website down here is CINCOHIO, C-I-N-C-OHIO.com, um, where you can learn about this, more about the center, and you can learn about more about CINCO Fund. In particular, what I encourage you to do is if you know nonprofits that need to get more earned revenue so that they can be sustainable, so they can meet the needs of the community, so they can stop constantly worrying about if they're going to be able to make another payroll, is we started workshops. Our first one was in August. Our next one is uh, this Thursday. It's at American Electric Power to talk about the issue of scaling, how you build a business, how you really, instead of thinking about a project, and uh, when the grants overstop it, how you can think about what size do we need to be cash flow positive and to be profitable. On October 7th at Limited Brands, we'll be actually having workshops on actually developing business plans for social enterprises, how you go about doing that. And on October 29th at the Glenn School, 
We'll be showing them how to make pitches to investors, which is so different than writing a grant application. So social enterprise, that funny word we've heard so much, is all about nonprofits developing earned revenue opportunities so that they can support the needs of their community, either through direct support of their nonprofit missions or, pro or prov helping the community by earning a profit by doing good. We started organizations here in Columbus that, if you're interested, would be glad to tell you about it so that we can work as hard on developing so social enterprises in our community as we do in developing small business and technology companies. Thank you very much. I believe we have time for questions. Any questions I can answer about what's going on in town? Yes. Um, no. Uh, a social enterprise is really no different than the business you run. Um, fundamentally, they are running it to earn a margin so they can support that. It's very different than philanthropy. When you deal with a social enterprise, you should be looking at them just as a regular business. That is, I'm not going to Life Care Alliance for a meal because I want to help them out. You want to go to Life Care Alliance because they provide a good product that I want to pay what it's worth. So that's, that's how it works. In fact, in, in uh, social enterprises where what they're doing is very separate from their mission, they may ultimately use the profits to support, they'll pay taxes just like any business that would be delivering this service to your door. Yes? What's the capacity for nonprofits or others to attend the workshops? Uh, is there a uh, registration limit uh, size? Four years uh, it's really based on the, um, the site we have. Right now we're able to handle about 60 people at every event. Our event at uh, uh, August 14th hit capacity at about 60. But um, uh, you can go basically go to the website and you can handle registrations there. By the middle of October we should have our schedule for 2015 posted. Yes. First of all, thank you for many years service on our own Columbus Rotary Foundation and all your contributions years past. Regarding the Cinco Fund, yes. so in a Life Care Alliance example, mm -hmm. your reference to Chuck Gary and say you need to save 80000 you'd participate on just the for-profit catering side as a Cinco Fund investor? Yes, Cinco Fund basically is an investment fund. It's an investment fund where you only invest in businesses that you think are commercially viable, that you'll be able to get your money back, and you'll be able to get a return. In social enterprise investment, though, different from technology, instead of aiming for getting a 60% IRR return, you're looking for something more modest. In, in, the, in something like a social enterprise fund, if you were to be an investor, you would expect to get your money back, and you'd probably expect to get about a 2% return in about five to seven years. But you know what? Ten-year Treasury securities pay 2.5%. You know, uh, Treasury bills are paying 20 basis points. So uh, in this day and age, that's really not bad. Other questions about what's going on in social enterprise? How you can get involved? One of the things I do ask you to do is if you know a nonprofit that's struggling, encourage them to find out about social enterprise. We have a lot of information on the website. Encourage them to go to these programs and learn about it. For some of them, it may not be their thing because this requires an entrepreneurial spirit. But at the same time, there'll be many that will want to do it and just don't know where to start. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Well, that was an interesting speech. Thank you. This is a gift from us, Thank you very from much. Argo and Lenny. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just to show that I, I learned quickly, by a show of hands, can you tell me how much I should find Mike Schrodinger for taking too much time and 
being creative by taking t too much time. <laughs> Find him. Find him. Thank you. <laughs> that, um, please join us next week for Kathy Kerr, who is going to speak about CASA of Franklin County. I believe it is uh, CASA is special advocates uh, being appointed for by the Franklin County, I believe the commissioners. That, that being said, the meeting is adjourned.